Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, coming back to Bin brings back some fantastic memories. Um, as Anita said, being back at the RTP conference two years ago, and I thought I'd be a lot more relaxed for this one. Uh, two years ago, the night before the conference, um, Kareem Khan, who was one of the keynote speakers, decided to tell me the night before um, that I was going to have 15 minutes as part of his keynote. And so I was up until about 4 o'clock in the morning, um, fueled by black coffees, um, and came up feeling you know, my, as if my heart was going to beat out my chest. And I thought, at least with this one, I had a few months' notice. Um, I thought it would be a lot more relaxed, but having to watch the experts talk about tendinopathies, and I, I know you'll have enjoyed it as much as I have, Ebony, Craig, and Jill in particular. I've got that feeling again, so <laughs> I hope you forgive me if I trip over at all. But it's a real honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, um, the faculty, to Mario in particular, and to the likes of Cindy and Elodie, who expertly <laughs> picked us up and made sure we didn't get lost on the way back from uh, Zurich Airport yesterday. Um, the days ran so well, and it's been an absolute um, pleasure to be a part of. So again, thank you to everyone who, who's, who's organized it. But what am I going to talk about today? So I'm going to talk about controversies in tendinopathy treatment, which has already been touched upon somewhat. But I'm going to go into a bit more detail, but also at the end come into a more broader context. Um, and because it's a Friday afternoon as well, we've got to have some fun while we're up here. So we'll make, make sure that you staying is worthwhile. So controversy within sports medicine. The two things aren't exactly mutually exclusive. So for instance, concussion, often in the media, is often contra controversy around that. What about back pain and MRIs? Do we treat the man, not the scan? Or, and do we scan too many people with mechanical back pain? What about arthroscopies and the, uh, the evidence base regarding those? And is it any better than sham surgery? Again, something that's quite often in the news. And one of my favorites, horse placental massage, and how fashionable this was a few years ago. And it's led, <laughs> and it's led people to, to, because some people within the industry work with therapies that have a limited evidence base, some people have raised an often controversial point of whether we justify and whether as a, an entire profession, whether we justify the term specialists or whether because of our use of, sort of li uh, therapies with limited evidence, whether actually we know better than snake oil salesmen, which is a horrible term. And what, now we go on to tendinopathy. So although it's probably not sexy enough to make the newspapers or TV, um, and it's probably more for the geeks in the room, there's always been controversy around that. Um, even as far as the, the definition and the terminology. So it used to be ingrained in, in all the sports medicine literature and the books that there was an inflammatory component. It was tend tendinitis. But then the likes of Kareem Khan came along and sort of debunked this fact and found that actually we need to move away from this inflammatory model and more towards some of the continuum models that Jill and um, Craig have, have worked on over the past few years. But then they came back to the inflammatory model, so there's always this controversy about you know, what's the pathophysiology and etiology of it. And even over the years, there's been controversy about the one thing that we actually know works, which is loading and exercise therapies. And is there a certain type of exercise therapy that's better than another? Is there a certain type of loading program, rest periods, um, that's better than another? But really, and I think what's been touched upon when it comes to controversy and tendinopathy is just sort of drawn towards these guru juices, as uh, Jill mentioned earlier. So here's one, PRP, doesn't need an introduction. Stem cells, some shockwave, and some proto-sclerotherapy. But let's start off with the really sexy stuff, PRP. So PRP, this is a, a study published in JAMA, in which, and the, you, can, you can all read the highlighted part, um, which found that 24 weeks follow-up, uh, PRP injection compared to the saline injection did injection did not result in greater improvement in pain and activity. And they had a, a corresponding trial published in the BGSM as well, which looked at the ultrasound and the sonogra uh, sonog sonographical results, which showed, again, absolutely no difference. But what if 24 weeks wasn't quite an adequate follow-up? Well, this study in the AJSM looked at one-year follow-up. And again, as you, as you can all see, this RCT showed no clinical or sonographical superiority of PRP over a placebo injection in Achilles tendinopathy at one year. <laughs> and again, looking, back, looking at some of the reviews, and this is a, a great one done by, um, by Co, which was also uh, recently updated in the Aspitar Journal. It's a fantastic read. And again, this can simply be summarized as there's currently little tangible clinical evidence to support its efficacy in chronic tendon disorders. And I'd like to thank my favorite Scotsman, uh, Al, for his earlier slide. Um, 
again, insufficient evidence, both research and practice-based, to recommend this treatment. Thanking another one of the speakers, Jill, we actually know that PRP can actually be harmful for tendons. So really, there's, judging from the evidence, is there a real need for, you, for the use of these? So, because it's Friday afternoon, I want everyone uh, to have some fun, and I won't be able to see hands in the back. Uh, can everyone get their phone out, please? Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? You can all turn the torch on like I can, and I want you to just respond to some of my questions, okay? In, in tendinopathy, how many of you, I want, to I want you to put your lights on if you would use PRP in the treatment of tendinopathy? Okay, very few lights. Um, and now put your lights on if you think it's inappropriate to use PRP in the treatment of tendinopathy. I know there's more phones than that. It's like an Adele concert now, it's amazing. Um, okay, but what I'd like to do is I know that the likes of Jill, Ebony and Craig have come all the way from Australia, so we'll make you guys work um, whilst you're here. I want to just do uh, quite a simple thumbs up or thumbs down as to what you think. So thumbs down, okay. <laughs> everything down, as predicted. So the evidence shows that it's wrong. All of us here think it's wrong, and even the experts think it's wrong. But actually, it's all of us here that are wrong. Rafa's got back to sport using PRP. Maria's got back to sport using PRP. Tyson Gay, Kobe. And even, st um, PRP has even managed to save entire franchises and has helped the Golden State Warriors actually win a, an NBA playoff. So, again, I'm really sorry to tell everyone here, even though there's a wealth and probably decades or hundreds of years worth of academic and clinical experience, that we're all wrong. So I'll give everyone another chance. So let's look at stem cells, which is maybe the, the, uh, the younger brother of, of PRP. And l let's look at the, at the evidence behind this. So this is a systematic review published in the British Journal, British Journal of Sports Medicine that started this year. And really, looking at the use of stem cells in tendinopathy, the results are really in the title. So there is no evidence for the use of stem cell therapy for tendon disorders. And sort of more poignantly, that they advise that the use of stem cell therapy for tendon disorders in clinical practice is not suitable outside of an appropriate ethics-approved clinical trial, which I would argue that probably not mo most practices and most, most elite sort of sport environments won't, be, won't apply to. So, same again. Lights on if you, th if you would use stem cells for um, a tendinopathy. I'm not blinded. Um, and then how many of you think, lights on if you think it's inappropriate to use stem cells for tendinopathy? Keep going. Okay, good. All right. Likewise goes that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Without even asking. So, we know it's a, it's a big thumbs down. But again, None out of two, unfortunately, for this audience, because we know that Cristiano Ronaldo's used stem cells um, to get back from injury, one of the best sportsmen of our generation, and probably one could argue ever. And the NFL are now using stem cells as, uh, as cutting-edge therapy. And really, just to add insult to injury, this guy's used stem cells and PRP to get back from injury, just to really rub it in our faces that we're all wrong. But one of the great things about working for the BGSM, one of the perks is that I've managed to get the keys to the BGSM Twitter account, which has its perks, definitely. And one of them is being able to put um, some surveys out there. And this is one I did a few weeks ago, which I think will probably reassure most people in the room. And this was asking whether there is a role for the likes of PRP and stem cells in the treatment of tendinopathy. And you're not actually alone. M the way over half thought that not currently, some thought never will be, and again, there was quite a, 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 about a quarter that said really, but again, wouldn't advocate it. And these were a few hundred respondents as well. And again, most people would, would agree with yourselves in this room that they think that it's inappropriate to use PRP in stem cells in tendinopathy. So I hope that sort of makes you feel a little bit better, because I know you didn't want just to hear, just hear from me with my... I graduated in July, so I haven't got years and years of experience to tell you. So I managed to ask some of these experts, so the likes of Ben Klaas and Nicole Van Dyke, Colin Lewin, um, Jill, Alan, Mario, and Babette Plume. And just in case the guys down here were a bit jet lagged today, it was an off day for them to get naught out of two is a bit wrong. Um, but everyone in this, there was everyone answered the exact same thing that they think that re the use of PRP in stem cells is currently inappropriate for tendinopathies. So we're now in a bit of a funny situation. Um, 
And we have to sort of pause, and this is where, and I promise that this talk's going to give you more, uh, more questions than answers. But at this stage, we probably have two main questions. And one, is there something wrong with the research? And two, why are top-level clinicians, and these are people who you know, have years and years of experience and are extremely good at their jobs, why are, why are they using these therapies on elite athletes? And, what, and I'm playing devil's advocate here. I don't necessarily, I'm just, again, poking the bear, maybe. Um, but is it because these elite, the people working in elite, in elite sport, that are working with the likes of Sharapova and Nadal, are they working with a different population to that studied in traditional research? And there might be factors to support this. So if you put PRP and tendons into PubMed, you're about, you'll get about 550 results. If you put PRP in elite, you're down to 19. And in the stem cell study that we, uh, systematic review we saw earlier, there were seven studies, all of which I should say had a high risk of bias. But none of these studies included a population of elite athletes. And in the output of these um, quite prominent sports medicine journals, um, I, I looked at their, at their output over the last month, and less than 10% of their articles actually look into um, and address elite populations specifically. So could you potentially argue that the results we're getting aren't indicative of what people are seeing at the coalface of elite sports medicine? And to draw, draw an analogy from another part of medicine, um, if there's one good thing that's ever come out of war, it's the fact that trauma management and pre-hospital care has progressed so much. And there was a, a really interesting fact that came out of one of the, um, of the Afghanistan war. And there was a, a three-month placement in Camp Bastion um, in Afghanistan. Gave as much trauma experience as 15 years of working within the NHS, which is our public system in the, uh, in the UK. And could you actually argue and transfer this to sports medicine? Are the, are the people working at the elite end with these superhuman athletes actually exposed to um, conditions that us at the, the, the cold face of normal sports medicine, if you like, that we don't just actually see? And are the results just a bit slow to filter down from that elite end down to normal practice? And again, I'm playing devil's, devil's, um, devil's advocate here. And can we necessarily argue that this practice is actually outside the realms of evidence-based medicine? So we know evidence-based medicine isn't just the blue, the blue um, circle here. We know that with the blue circle there, it might be caveats to the research itself, and there might be actually some issues with this. And when it comes to the individual clinical expertise, as I've just mentioned, are these clinicians seeing a completely you know, freaky um, group, of, group of athletes which aren't really used in and aren't really part of normal clinical trials? And have they got specific expertise that, again, isn't fe doesn't feature in the, um, in the, in the um, literature? What about patient values and expectations? Well, I would probably argue that the likes of Nadal, Sharapova, Kobe, Steph Curry would probably have slightly different expectations to your average Joe who just wants to get back to normal function and who might you know, be, the, be one of the participants in one of these studies. So could you potentially argue that they were still working somewhat with an evidence-based medicine framework? And if you're providing informed consent, if you're telling these athletes and being completely upfront with them that although, of course, um, if you were to do PR, this is the, uh, looking at Robert Jan de Vos's PRP study in JAMA, you might, you know, there is a chance that, you know, especially if you're, if you tried all the other conventional therapies, there's a slight chance that you might be one of these outliers. But as long as maybe you tell them that just as likely, you know, there's no, there's, it crosses the, the zero here, the, you also have a risk of being one of these non-respondents, and look at that one. Well, there's a chance you might be that guy. If you, if the athlete, if you're, you know, giving, inf if you're getting informed consent, that is it that bad? And I stumbled across this study, which is actually weirdly uh, featuring one of the one of the cardiologists here from the teaching hospital in Burton, and she argues that. So th um, they looked at the use of dual antiplatelet therapy, so um, aspirin and clopidogrel, one, um, after coronary stenting, so after a heart attack, stents put in, and the use of aspirin and clopidogrel in these patients. And they looked at n normal patients and patients with chronic kidney disease, which again is a sort of a subspecialist um, population group. And she argued, and the outcome showed that actually clinicians seem to be able to select the ideal chronic kidney disease population in whom dual antiplatelet therapy may and should be prolonged, better than conventional inclusion or exclusion criteria so far employed in clinical trials? And could we potentially speculate that it's likewise in the elite end of sports medicine? Could clinicians seem to be able to select the ideal um, 
population in which PRP and stem cells may and should be used better than the conventional inclusion or exclusion criteria so far employed in clinical trials? And I don't know, and is it a case, is there an argument that maybe the science is just a bit slow to catch up with the clinical practice? And again, I don't know, I don't have the answers here. So let's just sort of recap, and this is the real, gonna be the real basis of my talk. So let's just go through what we've, what we've heard so far. So there's currently no evidence to support the use of PRP or stem cells in the treatment of any tendon pathology. And I think we all agree on that. But maybe you could argue, and I know that some in the room would say that there's still no argument, but there might be other factors that justify the use, in elite, especially in elite sport, providing that informed consent is provided. But one thing's clear, as Ebony mentioned, we still need much further high-quality research. And as I said, this is where I was going to leave it, and it was just at a chance encounter last week um, at the BMA offices in London where I bumped into Jimmy Walsh. And for those of you who listen to the BGSM podcasts, Jimmy is the editor of these, um, and he has a really, he's an osteopath by nature, but also has a real interest in uh, anthropology and social medicine. And he told me about this study, and basically this study interviewed over 40 uh, medical professionals it, involved with elite uh, British football, soccer, and elite British cycling. And actually it looked into the use and some of the reasons behind the use of some of these biological therapies, so PRP, your stem cells. Um, and the results, actually, I couldn't believe them when I was reading it, so I thought it'd be criminal for me not to come here and share them with you. So, as opposed to, when they went into the reasons behind using some, some of these therapies, there wasn't the potential academic arguments that we've mentioned already. There wasn't the sort of admission that maybe the research was slow to catch up and that they were working with a population not studied in the research. There was actually quite widespread acknowledgement that Part of the, and I'll read, I'll, I'll read direct quotes from the study, that part of the problem is that there is a desire to jump on the next innovation with zero d data, i.e. acknowledging the lack of data, and driven partly by the desperate need to do something. And this is an admission by one of the leading sports orthopedic surgeons in the UK who works with many elite sports, uh, sports people. And this is quite worrying. It's an, it's an admission that people are simply using these therapies Basically, because especially in elite sport, they have to be seen to be doing something. And amazingly, as part of the Twitter surveys a few weeks ago, the vast majority, and again, this was over 150 respondents, thought that the main reason for actually using it was, fa was failure of other therapies. So again, there's a wider recognition within the industry that we're not using it because we're seeing anecdote. We're not seeing anecdotal evidence that it works within a, a within a, 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 the pop an elite population better than the research evidence. Again, it's sort of the, the Hail Mary response. It's the, last, it's the last throw of the dice to try and get people better. And I think this sort of throws up some, um, some questions that we, that we need to consider a bit more broadly. And my dream is uh, unapologetically to work within elite sports medicine. I'm nowhere near it at the moment, but that's my, that's my dream. Um, but I probably share with most of you in the room, I have a real pessimism with some of these therapies. So I actually asked on Twitter, whether actually refusing to use PRP in stem cells might actually affect someone's chances of wor working at the highest level. And encouragingly, 57% said no, although it's not as, sort of, as clear a majority as, as I was hoping. But that's when the I sort of got a bit demoralized when in the same group of experts who work at the elite end and work at the upper end with the research and work with some of these clinicians, they were actually of the opposite view, and they were in the majority that actually refusing to use these therapies might actually affect your chances of working at the highest level. Which I think leads us to sort of a quite a worrying place where, although we're, we're recognizing that we're only using it because we have no other option, we've run out of other treatment choices, are we going to then, does that then rule people out of pe <laughs> rule people out of actually work at the highest level if they refuse? And this is where um, the study got really interesting. So this is, again, a direct quote from one of the conclusions, where they compared the uh, access to the biotherapies, so to the PRP and stem cells. And they say that these biotherapies share features of magic practices in traditional societies, things like witch therapy. Um, but does that actually surprise us that much? So this is, I'm from South Wales originally, so my first love is rugby. Um, and this is a, an English player who's actually frustratingly quite good. Um, but he's been out for about two years with a whole spate of injuries, groin, pectoral injuries, and he's always been affected by tendinopathies. And he's just admitted that his, his medical department have actually sent him back home to Samoa 
um, to have a, a hex. He had, three, he had three hexes put on him, apparently. And if he's been to Samoa to have these lifted, whether that cures his injury problems, I don't know. But in the same study, here's another direct quote from one of the, um, from one of the club medical leads in the Premiership. And I'll read it. So, I, I have asked the manager if a player can go and see a witch doctor in West Africa. And people say, well, why on earth are you doing that? You're a scientific man. And the reason I'm doing it is because simply healing is more than simply science. It's founded in belief, and there's a science behind it. And there's two elements to this quote. So one, I think we all know, we all have those patients that we try everything on biologically, and we probably all understand that some patients' recovery has probably some form of psychological and social aspect to it that you probably need to address. And it's one thing, potentially, to call for the research to take this in, into account and to ask the, further, the future research into the use of some of these therapies accounts for the potential, the potential effect of a psychological and social aspects to this care. But actually, are we, as a specialty now, admitting that some of the therapies that we're using, which gain widespread att um, attention, that actually we're using them with the same evidence base and hoping for the same effect as magic. And I think realistically, for ever to be taken seriously, or if we ever want to be taken seriously in future as, as a specialty and as an industry, do we effectively have to make some form of stand to say that actually we're, go that we, we're, we're gonna take a stand against this? And again, someone said, I, I, I don't have the answer for this whatsoever. So taking it back now to the, to the conclusions, well, I think it's definitely worth repeating. There's no empirical evidence to support the use of stem cells or PRP in the treatment of any tendon pathology. But you could arrange an academic argument to justify the use, in elite, especially in elite sport, providing you get informed consent. But we do need more high-quality research, and we need high-quality research in elite sport, and again, potentially looking into the role of the, uh, this, the, psych the psychosocial aspect of, 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 of using these therapies, and whether it's all purely biological. But also more broadly, and this is what I wasn't really expecting to talk about, so we need to maybe realize that refusing to utilize these therapies may actually be a barrier to working at the highest level of sports medicine. And we also need to consider whether the profession is willing to associate itself with therapies that resemble traditional witch therapy. And if we're ever to shake off the, the conundrum of, uh, and the accusation that some people within this industry might actually be working as gurus or the hateful term snake oil salesman, then do we actually, as a, as a, as a specialty and as a, as a group, need to take a stand and say that until there's sufficient evidence, or at least evidence addressing some of these concerns, do we make a stand against their use? And again, I'm, I'm afraid, as I said, I've got, I'm giving you more questions than answers here. But I think it's definitely something to consider. So really, we're no further in the use of PRP in stem cells than the, that we know it works by the magic Shazam. And I'd just like to take this opportunity. I know that's not provided you with, ma with many answers at all, and maybe if you've got questions, I'd probably ask the three experts down here to come up and answer as opposed to myself. But I'd just like to take this opportunity to echo what they've said and to thank the faculty, um, and Mario in particular, for the, war, uh, for the warm welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Are there any questions so far? No, no, no. Oh, God. <laughs> Can I ask oh, one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, for that very interesting presentation. And as you rightly said, there is a lot of controversy. Now, my question is, do you think these elite sportsmen, when they go through any of these injections, the rehab program which follows can be much more pushed as was presented throughout the day and as Jill has been saying it since a long time, as compared to the other groups where it has really not shown to be effective. So if it is a rehab program rather than the PRP working, then even maybe without PRP, they could have still got better. Okay. Um, so I think what, what you're saying is can you use the PRP?